Hello, today I'd like to talk about integrating Cumulo audit logging with Elasticsearch. This video will discuss how you can capture logs from a Cumulo cluster and import this data in near real time into an Elasticsearch cluster. Because implementing Elasticsearch can be rather cumbersome, we will demonstrate how you can utilize Docker to greatly decrease your implementation time. Before we get into implementation, let me demonstrate what you will see once you have completely implemented an Elasticsearch cluster with Cumulo audit logging. So when you're done with this video, this is what you're going to see. This is a part of the Elastic stack that you were about to implement in the Docker cluster, and it's showing all the visualizations um, in inside dashboards. This will all be explained in the lectures uh, following in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, but uh, Let's just go through some of them so you'll see exactly what you're going to get into if you continue through this video. So I've got a markdown in one of the visualization panels. You can put anything there. You don't have to have it at all. I've uh, outlined how many clusters you have, how many audit log entries there are. I've uh, set this up so that you can actually pick uh, which cluster you want to look at, which protocol, uh, which operation. And then you can see entries by node. Uh, so you can see group one, two, three, uh, or any of the other ones that are there. And notice none of them have any entries really right now. I can see exactly how many protocol operations there are. I can see the file system operations. Did I did a, do a read? Did I do an open? Did I do a, you know, a write, uh, et cetera, and so on. I can look at the extensions and how many extensions I've worked on. The, .blk extension, I've had 272,000 operations against uh, BLK extensions. I've had 83,000 operations against .idx, etc. cetera. Um, how many accesses per time period? And that's set to 30 minutes, uh, a little bit too big right now because I've only had this running for a little bit. Same thing for status codes. And then uh, what are the paths that were deleted and who did them and how many times were they deleted? In this case, you'd wonder why would config.xml uh, be deleted six times in this time period? Uh, wouldn't you delete a file once? Well, yes, you would. But in fact, we deleted the program that's doing all this. I'm running a, um, a simulation right now of video surveillance. The program that's doing this, Milestone Software, is actually creating this file, deleting this file, creating this file, deleting this file, and it did it six times in the, in the time period, and I've got the time period set to 24 hours, which you can't see here right now, but just suffice to say that's what's happened. Uh, so that's it, and uh, you can, of course, create as many visualizations as you want, as many dashboards, and we'll go into some of that uh, throughout the following video. Thank you. Again, before we dive into implementation, please give me another couple of minutes of your time to talk about the architecture of the Elasticsearch implementation we are going to do today. You are viewing the Elasticsearch stack, also called the Elk stack. You can see that we have several products that Elastic provides that we will be utilizing. Beats is a generic term used to represent data collection routines. In our implementation, we'll only be using the file beats program. File beats will read files in the file system and pass them to Logstash with no further processing. Logstash will provide the filtering so that we can turn Cumulo audit logs into something that Elasticsearch can digest and index. Logstash will write directly into Elasticsearch, which in turn will store and index that data for later viewing and searching. Finally, Kibana is the program that provides analysis and visualization. Kibana utilizes the concept of panels created with visualizations. Those visualization panels can be placed on a dashboard or multiple dashboards that can be viewed. Additionally, Kibana can also do full reporting. Those reports can be viewed, emailed, or printed based upon your preference. We have left out one part and I will cover it now. The Cumulo Core cluster only has the capability of running its audit logs via the syslog protocol. Our syslog can take the audit logs provided by the Cumulo cluster and do several things with them. It can filter that data. It can pass it directly to Logstash. It can write it to files on the Linux machine that our syslog is configured on. We have decided to demonstrate having our syslog write directly to files on the Linux machine. Why? Well, let's assume that the Elastic Stack is down for some reason. 
If that is true, then where would the R syslog write the logs that were being collected from the Cumulo cluster? Without the elastic stack up 100% of the time, audit logs can be lost. That kind of defeats the purpose of audit logging, which is to capture all the configuration and file changes within a Cumulo cluster. With our syslog writing to files on the Linux machine, we can have file beats provide the data collection. Once the elastic stack is up and running, one of the nice features of file beats is that it remembers where it left off in terms of file processing. So if a file or even a piece of a file has been processed already, then file beats will pick up where it left off and pass that data log stash for filtering and writing to Elasticsearch. The Cumulo GitHub site is a repository of code, code snippets, or scripts that can be used to simplify programming through the Cumulo API, or in our case, demonstrating how to implement Cumulo core audit logging with Elasticsearch. Using a web browser, let's go to the Cumulo GitHub site. Type in github.com slash Cumulo. Here you will find different repositories of code, code snippets, and scripts. One of those script repository is called audit logs Elasticsearch. In this repository, I've completely documented this video along with some Docker implementation scripts in order to make your implementation much easier and faster. In order to use the information in any repository, you will want to clone that repository and place it on a Linux machine. Start by simply clicking on the repository you want, in this case, Audit Logs Elasticsearch, and look for the button called Clone or Download. Click that button and copy the information in the text shown. You can do that by simply clicking this button. As I discussed in the documentation on the GitHub site, you will want to identify four Linux machines that can be used to create a Docker cluster. I'll get into the whys in a couple of minutes. But for now, let's take the information that you copied from the GitHub site and paste it into a terminal window, prefacing it with the words git clone. This will download the repository onto your machine, as you can see here. Then you can cd into the directory and view the contents. We'll be going through all the contents in a step-by-step -step manner later in this video. Let's go back to the web browser. As a side note, I would recommend that you leave the documentation to the repository on the GitHub site open for further reading. This will be invaluable to your successfully implementing this exercise. So let's start the implementation. The first thing we must do is configure our syslog to receive the audit logs from the Cumulo cluster. Here are the steps that we're going to do in a moment in the terminal window. You'll notice that the commands that you type are in bold. They also preface with the word sudo, S-U-D-O. I will not be adding this word since I am logged in as a root user. I am making the assumption that you might be logged into your Linux machine as a normal user without root privileges, hence the sudo preface. Since everything that we are doing requires root privileges, either change to a root user or preface your commands as listed here. Remember that all of this is in the documentation on the GitHub site. Notice that one of the four machines that I've identified to use the Docker cluster is also going to be my R syslog server. So based upon the commands I showed you a couple of seconds ago, let's get started. First, we need to modify our etc. r syslog.com file. Just using an editor, whatever you're comfortable with, in my case it's Emacs, just go through and edit that file. What you're looking for is the line uh, for the TCP protocol, which is right here, with port 514. And uncomment those, and that's it. Just save it. Next, I've made this very easy for you. We've got to create a configuration file for the way the audit logs will look coming from the Cumulo, and that has to go into the etc. R syslog D. Now, according to the documentation, you can just copy and paste everything I've listed in there, or you can actually go to the R syslog D directory, and I've done it for you. So just copy that file and put it into R syslog D. And go to that directory and just kind of make sure that that file has the correct permissions, which should be root root. And if you're interested in what that file looks like, there it is. So basically what I've done 
is I've said that I want to, and this is the most important things, store the logs into a directory called var log cumulo. And I want to put them into comma delimited format. And there's the format that it's going to write it in. Um, it's not necessary for you to notice or know what uh, the syslog or our syslog format is. If you want to know more about it, you can read up on it on Google. Um, but that's basically it. Now, so what we need to do now is create that var log cumulo directory since it doesn't exist. So let's just go do that. And cd to var log. And one of the things that you're going to notice right away is that that cumulo entry, which is right here, has ownership by root root, which is not good because uh, the problem is, is that syslog runs as the syslog user. So what you've got to do is you've got to change the owner to syslog.adm as admin group on the Cumulo directory. And now what you should see is there's the syslog admin on Cumulo. And that's it. Um, in order to get that to work, you've got to restart the syslog service. So that's just system CTL restart our syslog. Uh, My apologies. Sorry. I couldn't hear what you said. My Siri getting involved there too. And just do that. System. And just do a status. And there you see that it's actually running. You see active and running. And there are no errors anywhere in this message. So that tells you all you need to know about uh, our syslog at this point. So let's go back to the repository, which is in my home directory. The next thing you're going to configure is log rotate. If we didn't have the Linux machine rotate the logs after a certain size, the problem would be that the Cumulo audit logs could potentially fill up the rsys log server. Of course, that is based entirely on the amount of changes that are made on the Cumulo cluster. Again, I made it simple for, for you in that I have created the log rotate script already. And you can see that in the uh, log rotate directory, and it's called Cumulo. This needs to be placed into the directory, et cetera, log rotate.d. So we're just going to copy that into log rotate.d. There is nothing you have to do to restart the log rotate uh, system as it only runs once per day and it will load its configuration when that happens. Now it is time to configure the Cumulo cluster to use our R syslog server for audit logging. Go to the Cumulo cluster UI as shown and select the cluster tab and then the audit tab. Now simply plug in the name of the uh, of the server or the IP address that we configured our syslog on. So I'm going to type in the name of the machine and select the port address. Now, the default port is 514. You can select custom and put in any other port number, but remember that had to have been configured in the our syslog server as well. Now click Save. At some point, you'll see the word connected come up, and it is now connected to the rsyslog server that we just configured. So the final step in our rsyslog configuration before we move on is to verify that it's working. The easiest way to do that is to go back to our terminal windows and see if there are any files in the directory. Remember, we placed this in slash var slash log slash cumulo. So type in ls-l var log cumulo and we'll see that uh, there are multiple files in there each node will create its own audit logs and those files will have the cluster name with the dash and then the number of node of course you may not see anything if you don't have any traffic the easiest way to generate some traffic is to simply log out and then log in on the ui this will generate a login event let us move now into phase two of our last search with Cumulo audit logging project, and that is installing Docker. Before we go there, some of you are probably asking, why Docker? Or what is Docker? 
Docker is a tool designed to make it easier to create, deploy, and run applications by using containers. Containers allow a developer to package up an application with all the parts that it needs, such as libraries and other dependencies, and ship it all out as one running package. By doing so, thanks to the container, the developer of the application can rest assured that the application will run on any Linux machine and Windows machines, regardless of any customized settings that machine might have that could differ from the machine used for writing and testing of the application. Why did we pick Docker instead of VMs? Let me answer that with a quote from James Bottomley, former parallel CTO of server virtualization and a leading Linux kernel developer. VM hypervisors such as Hyper-V, VMware, KVM, and Zen are all based on emulating virtual hardware. That means they're fat in terms of system requirements. Containers, however, use shared operating systems. This means they are much more efficient than hypervisors in system resource terms. Instead of virtualizing hardware, containers rest on top of a single Linux instance. That means you can leave behind the useless 99.9% VMware junk, leaving you with a small, neat capsule containing your application. Therefore, according to Bottomley, with the perfectly tuned container system, you can have as many as four to six times the number of server application instances as you can have using Zen, KVM, or VMware on the same hardware. Docker enables developers to easily pack, ship, and run any application as a lightweight, portable, self-contained container, which can run virtually anywhere. It is the ultimate instant application portability. With our Elasticsearch with Cumulo Log8 uh, application, I was able to create a group of containers that included all the dependencies to run Elasticsearch, FileBeats, Logstash, and Kibana without having to spend hours loading virtual machines. And the last question you may be asking is, can Docker coexist on VMs? The answer is a resounding yes. At the most basic level, VMs are a great place for Docker hosts to run. And by VMs, I mean VMs in all their forms, whether it's VMware, Hyper-V, or Zen, or KVM, all of them will serve equally well as a Docker host. Depending upon what you need to do, a VM might be the best place to land those containers. But the great thing about Docker is that it doesn't matter where you run your containers, and it's totally up to you. Can Docker container-based services interact with VMware-based services? Again, the answer is absolutely yes. Running your application in a set of Docker containers doesn't preclude it from talking to the services running in a VM. Another area where, you can, uh, where there can be synergy between VMs and Docker containers is in the area of capacity optimization. VMs gained early popularity because they enabled higher levels of server utilization. That's still true today. A vSphere host, for instance, can host VMs that may house Docker hosts, but that may also host any number of traditional monolithic VMs. By mixing and matching Docker hosts with traditional VMs, sysadmins can be assured that they are getting the maximum utilization out of their physical hardware. In order to install Docker, we'll need to load some packages into our Ubuntu hosts. Remember that we need to build a Docker cluster having at least four physical or virtual machines. We're going to type the following commands into each one of the terminal sessions that we have open. In order to make this video a little shorter, I'm going to demonstrate this on one terminal and then do the rest outside of the video. You will, of course, have to do it on all four of your terminal sessions. When that's done, we'll come back into the video and show you how to create a Docker cluster. One thing to note is that Ubuntu uses a traditional APT uh, distribution system and its commands to load packages. However, there is a problem in Debian Linux distributions and Ubuntu is one of those uh, distributions. That is that APT can have problems with loading the Docker-CE package and some of its dependencies. There's another package manager called Aptitude that we might have to load to clear up those dependencies. It will be a lot easier if you take all the commands needed to install Docker from the documentation on the GitHub site 
and simply copy and paste them into your terminal windows versus typing them and make possibly making mistakes. So go to the section on configuring Docker Engine to run on your four machines. Right here and click on the link for Docker Engine. Once there, scroll down to the VM map count right here and the installing Docker on Ubuntu 18.04. So let's get started. I'm going to zoom in so that you can see my terminal window better, but that documentation is still there even though you can't see it, and I'm simply copying and pasting those commands into my terminal window. So the first command we're going to execute is needed because Elasticsearch uses a memory map directory in order to store its indices. The default OS limits on memory map files and directories is likely to be too low, which may result in out of memory conditions. So just a moment here while I copy and paste. The second command is actually essentially the same thing, except we're going to save it in the system configuration file so that if something happens and the machine needs to reboot, that in fact it's, uh, it's stored and it comes back up uh, properly. So now we'll proceed uh, with uh, using the apt command to start uh, loading some of our packages. So these are supporting uh, repositories that are needed for uh, Docker. And then we need to set up uh, the Docker repository uh, location with APT so it knows where to go. And I'll issue an OK. And then add the repository to the uh, repository um, notification list. And then, of course, do another APT get update so that it refreshes that list and then install Docker. Now, this is where you might see um, an error, and this happens only in Debian versions of Linux, of which Ubuntu is one of them. And we may get an error right there where we have broken packages. And that can only be fixed by using aptitude. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually go and install aptitude. And then with aptitude, we can do the install of docker-ce. We don't need the other package names because watch what will happen. It will come up and say, I've noticed that there's a, a problem with the package. What do you want to do? You could say yes here, but it still won't install it correctly. So the correct answer is to say no so that it will go through and come up with the error, which is container D. And at that point, you just say yes, and it will go and fix everything. And when this is done, you'll be able to see that Docker is up and running by doing Docker info. And here you can actually see that Docker is installed and running on this machine. Another way to look at it is make sure it's running in the background is do a status on Docker. And there you see it's actually running right there and there are no errors in the, in the system. So that's it for installing Docker. Now do that on your other three machines and we'll be back. Now that you have installed Docker on all four of your physical or virtual machines, let's go and create a Docker cluster. Docker has a concept of management nodes and worker nodes. All manager nodes are also worker nodes, but for fault tolerance reasons, we must have at least three management nodes. Since we're only working with four machines, we will make all of our nodes into management nodes for this cluster. If you want to add more than four machines, you should add them as worker nodes, as management nodes have a little bit more overhead to make sure all the Docker cluster state is replicated between all of the management nodes. Okay, on the first node, we need to find out the IP address of the machine on the primary Ethernet network. 
This is necessary for Docker to communicate all of the state. It is only necessary if you have multiple Ethernet NICs or if you have wired and wireless Ethernet. In that case, you must explicitly tell Docker which IP address to use to communicate the state of the cluster. So we'll do this by looking at the primary network, which happens to be BR0 on my machine. Sorry, got to type this correctly. And you'll see right here that my IP address is 10.220.246.26. So I'm actually going to use that now and say Docker swarm init. And then I advertise the address of 220.246.26. And now that has created a Docker um, swarm with one node in it, which is worthless at this point, because remember, we have to have three management nodes as a minimum. Let's go look at Docker info. You're going to see if I scroll up that we actually have a, um, a swarm here, if I could find where it is. My swarm is active, okay? And in there, I only have one machine at the moment, which is right here, one manager address, and that's it. So I don't have a healthy swarm at this point. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go and um, get the other three machines on the network. And the way I do that is on this one that has a incomplete swarm of which uh, there's only one management node. I will type in the command docker swarm join token and I want to join as a manager. And what it will do is it will put out a command right here and you copy and paste that into the other machine. So let me bring up the other machine so you can see it. And now that node's part of the swarm. Do that on the other two. Let me bring that up. There's the third one. And here's the fourth one. And so now if I come back to the first machine and say Docker info, you'll see that we are a swarm. Okay, right here, the swarm is active. And we have four management nodes and uh, four managers and four nodes. So every node is now a manager. And here are my addresses for each one of them. So I now have a healthy cluster. And I could see that from every machine. And let me go bring this one up. And you'll see that I have the exact same thing. So they're all talking to each other. I have my swarm. It's active. I have four managers and four nodes. And down here, here are my management addresses. So congratulations, you now have a complete four node Docker cluster. Now we'll move on to configuring Elasticsearch with Docker. Here is where you're gonna see the advantages of Docker. If you were to configure Elasticsearch without Docker, you'd have to install Java, well, because Elasticsearch uses Java, but then you'd have to install all the packages of the Elk stack, including Elasticsearch, Log, Stash, File, Beats, and finally Kibata. And you would have to do that on every single machine of your four machines. Some of you out there may be asking, well, if you have to install Elasticsearch and all of the uh, components of the Elk stack on four machines, what is the point of a Docker cluster and how does that help? Well, that'd be a very good question. And here's where Docker also simplifies install and configuration. In addition to removing the need to load all those packages, i.e. Elasticsearch, Logstash, Filebeats, and Kibana, we also need to worry, don't need to worry about supporting packages like Java, etc. More importantly, with the Docker cluster, Docker will manage how many copies of Elasticsearch, Logstash, Filebeats, and Kibana at the start based upon a Docker configuration file, which we'll go into in a minute. An Elasticsearch container, for instance, includes all the supporting packages needed for Elasticsearch to run. No installing or configuring those packages, which could take hours to get right. Okay, so now we're going to actually uh, configure the individual components, file beats and log stash. And I'll give you a demonstration on the um, on the Docker configuration file. Not that you need to know much about it. But um, let's go back to our first node where we downloaded the GitHub repository and CD into it. I've already done that, so I'll just do an LS. 
and you'll see some things in there. One of them is, and they're, they're highlighted in bold, these are directories, elk log rotate, our uh, syslog.d, and you've already used some of those. Um, the first thing we have to do is look at the configuration for file beats. Now, file beats, if you remember, reads the log files that our syslog has written into var log cumulo. And we'll do that by going into beats and file beat and leave this exactly where it is because uh, Docker is very particular about where this is based upon the configuration file. Now, if you want to move these around, you have to change the configuration file, but I don't think that's really necessary. Um, go look at filebeat.yaml. And the only thing you should have to change in here is uh, if you wanted to put the log file somewhere other than var log, you would specify that here. If you change that from the beginning uh, when you configured our syslog, and leave it as star dot log star because um, that way we'll pick up all the log files and all of the log files that may have been rotated while the elk stack was uh, down, for instance. Even if the log rotate works for two days and this is shut down for two days, when it starts up, it'll pick up all the rotated logs it hasn't seen yet. Because remember, file beats remembers where it left off. Then next, come down to uh, the host and that's going to be log stash at 10514. That's the port number. If you want to change the port because that's already in use, you would do it here. Otherwise, nothing to configure here. Just leave it alone. Now let's go up a couple levels. And we're going to look at log stash. And look at the configuration file there. And, oops, sorry, it's in pipeline. And look at logstash.conf. I've got a couple of other little files in there. You'll see I may take these out in future uh, updates of the GitHub repository. But they're things I used in order to debug um, uh, the um, filtering of Logstash. So if you were to look at this, there's a whole bunch of things in here that uh, you may want to look at. But I wouldn't change any of it. The only thing you want to change is the port number to match what you have in file beats. Everything else should be left alone because basically what I'm doing is I'll walk you through it. This is all the filtering from this point until uh, here's the start with the open brace until the close brace. And inside there, I've got the fact that I've highlighted that it's a CSV or common delimited file. It has these fields uh, called cumulo timestamp node, et cetera, and so on. And then what I do is I start going through and filtering all of these things so that I can start to get cluster names out, et cetera, and so on. Again, don't change any of this. The only thing you should change is the port number up top and then leave that alone. And then next, we'll go back up to the, uh, go back up. So we've got to go one more level. There's the deploy stack. And this will be the script that runs. Leave the first one alone. You need to change the node one to be the name of node one. And I just happen to be on it. That's where I downloaded it. So you're going to want a 40 gig. And oops, DQ2 A 40 gig. Now notice, I didn't put in the uh, complete uh, name of the machine, which is .eng.cumulo.com, because the name that you want is the name that's used by Docker. So uh, if you actually go into Docker, you can have it print out the node names uh, for you, and it will show you that it's only the shortened name. Um, I am going to use Elasticsearch version 7.5.0, which is the latest. And the last thing I should point out is the username and password. This does not matter at all. Um, the only reason it's in there is if you decide to pay for um, the complete version of Elasticsearch, which most people would not do. It's a very complete version to use the open source. But if you would choose to use the paid version, the licensed version, then you can get a complete login capability for Kibana. And here's where you would specify the initial login ID and the initial password. And then you would change that in Kibana uh, to actually go and look at it. And then uh, I need to save that, of course. 
And then finally, uh, I'm going to show you the Docker Compose file. This is the configuration file uh, for actually starting up Elasticsearch. So come in here, and this is, a, you know, you should go look at the documentation if you want to understand this. I could spend an hour or two on telling you all of the different things that we're going to uh, do here. Uh, but uh, let's suffice to say that we're going to have a proxy. I'm not going to talk about Swarm Listener. And the proxy will basically run on each of the four machines and basically intercept port 80 and redirect it to Kibana. So even though I only have one Kibana running and two Kibanas running, um, and they may be on different nodes of the Docker cluster, uh, whenever I go to any node, uh, DQA, uh, dash 40 gig or B dash 40 gig or C dash 40 gig or D dash 40 gig and go to port 80 in a web browser, that uh, proxy will grab that data and send it to the correct node where um, Kibana is running. Pretty cool, isn't it? So now you don't have to go and direct uh, your web browser to the specific node where Kibana is running. You don't even have to worry about it. Just go and, uh, and do that. You could even uh, create in DNS around Robin so that if they go to, say, for instance, a, a machine in DNS that you call Kibana, you could put four IP addresses in it of all four nodes of the Docker cluster and just have them go to HTTP uh, Kibana, and that would take you to any one of the four nodes, and that would be proxied over. And then we have Elasticsearch, and that sets up uh, the cluster for Elasticsearch. And what's interesting is this deploy verb right here that I've highlighted. Um, and I'll just do it with the, the cursor here that says global. That says start up a copy of Elasticsearch on every node of the cluster. The global is what does that. And basically, then it will uh, start up a very dynamic Elasticsearch and it will spread those IOs out so that what will happen now is that um, I will get an Elasticsearch that can handle a very um, a big database and lots of records coming in from my uh, audit logs. Because what's gonna happen is if you've got a uh, audit logging system where you're making lots of changes to your Cumulo cluster, uh, our syslog will have no problem going to one syslog machines, but Elasticsearch, you don't want just one Elasticsearch machine. Number one, it's not fault tolerant. Uh, and if you lose that one machine, then you would lose your entire database. With a four node Elasticsearch cluster, I can lose pieces of the database, but I will still have uh, replicas and shards that will stay up and running. Again, terms that are used in Elasticsearch, and you can look that up yourself in Google, shards and, uh, and uh, replicas and read up on them if you're so interested. But you can lose multiple nodes in Elasticsearch and the entire thing stays up and running. Uh, next, we will start a copy of Logstash and we'll start a copy of FileBeats. And here's where it gets that uh, file, uh, the Logstash configuration file and uh, the FileBeats configuration file, which you edited before. And uh, that's pretty much it. So that's all you have to do. And uh, now you're done. That's it. You, now you're wondering, I'm sure you're saying, what? But I haven't really done anything. I edited one config file and changed one thing for file beats. I changed one thing for log stash, or maybe you didn't change anything at all. Uh, what did I do? Well, you've just seen the power of Docker and Docker cluster. And so to prove it, uh, let's actually start the cluster. I'm going to take a little break. I've been talking here for probably about five, six minutes straight. And so I'm just going to pause this and come back in and we'll start up Docker. So I've had my drink of water during our short break and we're back to start up our Elasticsearch cluster. Before we start up Elasticsearch or the complete ELK stack with Docker, I have to fix one thing I forgot to mention in the previous lecture. I knew I spoke too long. I forgot to tell Docker on which node to start file beats. One thing that you should know about Docker cluster is it will start the containers in the Docker Compose file on any node that is available. Well, that won't work for file beats because it must be running on the same machine where our syslog is running and configured from our previous lectures. If it isn't running there, then it won't see the log files in slash var slash log slash cumulo. So how do we do that? 
Well, it's quite simple in Docker to tell the cluster where to place a container. That is done with the label add command. So on the node of the Docker cluster where you want file beats to run, type docker node update dash label add file beat equal true and the node name. Um, that would be the node name of where you want uh, the, the uh, file beats to run. And you can see I've already got the command pre-typed. I'll just hit enter and there it's already been accepted. Now, let's look at what we've got in our uh, GitHub repository. We've got a, uh, a shell script that we call deploystack.sh. And one of the things that you want to do is you want to look at the permissions of that file. And you want to make sure that you have your mode bits for execute set and that uh, you have the permissions correct. So because uh, this must run as root, uh, one of the things you may want to do is put a sudo on the front of it if you're a non-root user. I am a root user, so I don't need to do that. And also, I want to make sure that I have the permission bits. So if you don't see X on there, then you're going to want to set it on everything. So on owner, on group, and on other, you see they're already there. But I'll just show you how to do it real quick. And it didn't really change anything because of the fact that I already had them there, but there they are. And then in your case, you may do a sudo with uh, deploy stack. Uh, I'm sorry, you need dot slash deploy stack. Or in my case, I'm going to leave it off. And now just run it. And it's going to tell Docker to start up everything that was in the Docker compose uh, dot YAML file. And we're going to let that uh, just settle out a little bit there. Okay. And now we can check the status. So the way that you actually do that is say docker stack ps cumulo. Now, the name that, I've got to spell it correctly, the name that I specified in the docker compose file was cumulo. It could be anything that you want it to be, but I'll just leave it there, it's, it's fine. And then you'll see that uh, we've got things running. You may want to make your screen a little bit wider to see everything, mine's wrapped. But basically you can see now that I have got a, uh, a uh, these are the Docker images. So there's a Elasticsearch one, two, three, four. Remember, it will start up an Elasticsearch for every node that you have in your Docker cluster. And you can see that it started on node DQ2 and it wrapped D, C, B, I'll just highlight it there, and A, okay? It started file beat. And file beat was started on A, which is exactly where we want it because that's where my R syslog is running. You've got log stash and that's running. You've got the flow proxy. I've got two of them running. I've got one on B and then one on C. And of course, Docker started them up wherever it wanted and then Kibana and that's running on D. Again, it's running wherever it wants. So uh, with the proxy that I was talking about, this flow proxy, it will listen on all the por on port 80 and port 443, the secure port, SSL port, for all of the nodes in your cluster, and it will redirect that traffic to wherever Kibana is. In this case, it's on node D, as you can see here, and this is where Kibana is running. And that way you do not have to worry about where Kibana is running, it's just there. So now we're gonna go check the health of Elasticsearch and see if it's up and running. And one of the ways that you can do that is that you can actually have this command called curl, where you can issue an HTTP command. And I'm going to do that and see what's going on with Elasticsearch. And look at that. I've got Elasticsearch answering me, and it said that Cumula Logs is configured, and I've got 24 shards. Um, everything is in the green, so status green, meaning everything is healthy across the entire cluster. It's got four data nodes, and it's got everything up and running. And I'm really happy right here. We've got 100% of everything is running uh, and we're good. So we'll come back in a minute, gonna take another short break. And now we'll configure Elasticsearch through Kibana so that we can start to see our visualization panels. So welcome, we're back from our short break. And now we're gonna go back into the browser and actually verify everything, look at Kibana and get our visualizations built. I'm back in my documentation from my GitHub repository, and I'm at the location where I'm verifying Elasticsearch's indexing data. 
So the way you do this is just open another tab, go to, as you remember, any node of the, uh, of the Docker cluster and type in the name, and that will be intercepted by the proxy and sent direct to Kibana. So I don't even know, need to know where it is. And there's Kibana up and running. Okay, and I'm going to explore in my own. I don't want to load sample data. I don't want Kibana to do that. And now what we're going to do is we're going to come down here to the management tab. You see it's highlighted. Click it and come to Elasticsearch. Don't do anything else but this at the moment because we don't have anything loaded right now. And just do index management. And the first thing you're going to see is there's Cumulo audit logs. It's already created. I showed you in the uh, curl command previously that everything was healthy. We have two replicas, four primaries, which are called shards, by the way. Uh, and now look at all the docs that are loaded. And so we actually have docs that are loaded. Docs are the names of um, all of our audit logs in slash var slash um, uh, log slash cumulo uh, that FileBeats is loading. So that means FileBeats is working because it's actually loading documents. And I should be able to hit reload and actually see that increment. You just saw it there and we're incrementing uh, because uh, FileBeats, as it sees things added to the audit logs, will automatically add them into the doc count. Now, and the next thing we need to do is go in and load in saved objects because I need something called an index pattern. But I've done this for you. Rather than go in and create index patterns and create all the visualizations and create all the dashboards, um, I've actually gone and saved them from a previous uh, working copy and I put them in the directories. And so I'm using a uh, Mac, as you can see, and so this is the uh, downloaded repository, GitHub repository, just viewed through the finder. And you'll see there's a directory called visualizations. And if you were to go into that, there is a saved uh, JSON file, which was the saved uh, copy of everything I had in Kibana when I built this. And now you're gonna be able to load that. So one of the things that we're gonna do is that we're gonna go into saved objects. We're going to import and then what you're going to need to do is drag and drop this file on top of there, hit import, and it's going to say successful, say done. And then you're going to see everything in there. Now, this may look like it's all there, but trust me, Kibana is still doesn't have all its brains until you hit the refresh of your browser. So hit the refresh of your browser, Kibana reloads, and that will load the index pattern correctly. So if you go into index patterns, you see the index pattern is there, and the index pattern lists exactly what types of fields they are, and that's really what we're looking for, is all those field names and what type of data it is. So that way, when I go to the visualizations panel right here, what you'll see is all the visualizations I previously created. Uh, so you can have pie charts and bar charts and vertical bars and, and all different kinds of things. So for instance, percentage of file system operations. If you would click it, there is what it looks like. And I built that up so that what we'll have is I'm looking at what types of file system operations were done and you can create any metric that you want. I mean, you can create any visualization that you want and just go through and in the visualize button, just come here and create a new visualization and go through and do that. Now, visualizations by themselves are meaningless unless you put them on a dashboard. And so here is the dashboard button. If you click it and you go, and you can have as many visual uh, dashboards as you want, just take create dashboard, just click on the dashboard and there's all your visualizations. And so these are all the ones that I've loaded. I will go through them briefly um, so this was uh, kind of explained to you in the very beginning, but what we've got is the amount of clusters, what the counts were, uh, the node entries, uh, the, the highest uh, nodes or where they're coming from, uh, what protocols, what file system operations, user accesses per time period, it's currently set to 30 seconds, what are the file extensions that we have and how many operations are occurring, uh, what about the status codes? Did we get any errors? And what about all the deletions? And of course, you can do all different kinds of things. I've even created, I think I have it here. 
Yes, in the Canvas, that's where you do written reports. So you can do email reports or visualization reports, or you can actually uh, print these out on a printer. And I created one called the delete report. So you can actually see all the files that were deleted, what time they were deleted, and who did them. So that you can actually, if you want to, put in search terms here and create a report. I don't think you want to print out a 40-page report of everything that was deleted. What you probably want to do is you want to go through and change this report so it searches from a particular time period or from a particular user or a particular file or directory. So this way, if you have... Um, you know, God forbid, a malicious user who's deleted data or uh, data went missing uh, inexplicably. Um, there is always an explanation. Of course, you can go through and create a report and find out exactly what happened to it. The power of audit logging. So again, back to my dashboard. Uh, I'll show you one further thing here. And that is notice the time period. I'm only looking at the last 15 minutes. Do the pull down. Uh, do yourself a favor and set it to 24 hours. And now you see I've got all of my accounts in there because as you saw in the beginning, I had 300 and some thousand records. How come I was only showing, you know, whatever it was in the last 15 minutes? Um, you know, that was what, uh, 3,200. So now let's go look at 24 hours. And the other thing you want to do possibly is set your refresh time and hit the start button. Now this will update the screen every five, 15, well, I set it to five seconds, every five seconds, and you can actually see what's happening here. I also set some controls. So you can actually pick which cluster you want to look at. Uh, you can pick which protocol you want to look at. You can pick which operation. So if you say, oh, I want, only want to see file crates. And uh, you know what? I also want to see file deletes. And then what you do is apply the changes and now you'll only see uh, you know, the entries by, um, by cluster, and you'll see the counts, you'll see the protocol, and you'll see uh, how many file crates and deletes there were, and then you can see the accesses for every 30 minutes. What are the um, extensions? And those are only for file crates and deletes now. Um, you'll see, of course, the deletes won't change here, the path names or the status codes, but you'll see all those there. And then if you want to clear it, just hit clear form, apply the changes, and you'll get all the records back. That's it. That is uh, Cumulo Core Audit Logging in Elasticsearch. And we did this all in less than 60 minutes, including all of my uh, lectures there. So as you can see, we didn't spend hours to get this implemented. Uh, we spent less than an hour, including all the lectures and all the explanations. And uh, I hope that you can use this. and. Um, and uh, get some um, uh, meaningful information from your Cumulo audit logs. Let me know, by the way, uh, my email address is at the bottom of the documentation in the, uh, in the GitHub distribution. Uh, send me a, a nice email, let me know if you're using this, and also uh, what other visualizations you've done. That would be kind of cool, I'd like to know. These were just off the top of my head, but there's a lot of data in there and you could do all different kinds of things. Thank you for watching.